Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peter Hecht. Uh, we've been conducting now virtual uh, webinars uh, for what seems like a lifetime, right? This is, uh, this is uh, the, the pandemic effect in full effect. Um, I am coming to you live. Uh, I used to smile and say, this is great. I'm coming to you live from our virtual headquarters at my home at Engine 4 in the New Jersey Turnpike. It's not so funny anymore. I'm still here. <laughs> I want to get out of my house really, really bad. You have no idea. Three kids. Uh, three dogs, my, uh, my wife and kids have decided to do some renovations. So we've got some construction people here. So I'll, I'm locked up in my gym, but you can't tell because I've got this awesome Magna virtual background. Um, so here I am, I'm loving life, uh, COVID free, still trying to dodge the COVID bullet, keeping my fingers uh, crossed, hoping everybody's healthy. For those of you that have never attended a Magna webinar before, uh, these are free educational seminars. Uh, and we have some fantastic guests with us today. And before I get to them, I just want to give you all a brief introduction to Magna. Uh, you know, pre-COVID-19, we would do these in the bricks and mortar environment. We would do these at your firm. Uh, I would host uh, some really great events in Las Vegas and Miami and Atlantic City, uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Yes, Atlantic City can be fun and can be safe. Um, and through those events, I would meet a lot of new people. And so with our, our folks in the sales group, and we would get a chance to tell you about all of our great stuff, like our, our, our deposition services, which, by, by the way, uh, is 95% all virtual today and is continuing to be virtual. And we do not charge for our virtual platform like some of our competitors. So you should call your uh, Magna sales reps if you're interested. Uh, we do record, medical record retrieval services, Paul, in case you didn't know that. You, know, you should give me a call and order some records up for anybody that gets injured. You need a police report, an MRI. We got you covered. We bought record tracks uh, about a year ago. Uh, we've got some incredible, incredible bandwidth. Um, we want to do a remote arbitration, a bench trial, a mediation. Uh, we've got the platform, the technicians. We've got the exhibit experts. We know how to do all that stuff. stuff. And, you know, traditionally in the bricks and mortar environment, none of this stuff really existed. Um, and so this is the way I'm going to communicate it to you through our webinars. What you're seeing here today is how we would actually conduct a lot of these virtual depositions. Um, and then we are also an ALM award-winning um, online jury research uh, company and visual communications firm. You're going to meet my colleague, uh, Scott Horowitz. He actually heads up our visual communications group. He's uh, hailing from Chicago, if you couldn't uh, guess from that little uh, bean or whatever that is behind his head over there. Um, we know that Pete is, uh, is out on the West Coast, and uh, you know he is um, the premier expert in construction defect cases and and this is our second time coming out together. So I'm really excited uh, to see you, Pete. And then last but not least is a uh, old friend of mine and somebody that just reminded me about, you know, the sad state of where we are today is Aileen Schwartz. And Aileen, uh, Aileen and I go back many, many years. Uh, I chased her uh, over the internet uh, to try and be a speaker at my conferences. She played hard to get for a couple of years. And then finally she came to our, one of our Chop for Chop events where we raised money for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We've been BFFs for a very long time. And she was so gracious to actually be one of the first panelists on our uh, pandemic webinar webinars, which unfortunately was a year ago. And so she's back on stage with us again, coming in from exit four off the New Jersey Turnpike as well. No, she doesn't live with me. She's in Cherry Hill. I'm in Mount Laurel. So um, that's all I got to say, Paul. I wanted to give a little plug for Magna because I can't come to your office and take you out for a drink yet, but I will be, and so will my sales folks. So, Paul, the floor is yours, and I will see you all at the end of the hour. Thank you. All right, Peter, great. That uh, awesome intro. Thanks to uh, everybody who's joining us today. Um, my name is Paul Danner. I'm a, a, an attorney with Goldberg Segala. I'm resident in our Newark office, and I head up our construction defect practice. Uh, we, we have a, a national footprint. Um, I'm primarily in, in New York, New Jersey, tri-state area, uh, but do handle matters uh, across the spectrum. Um, we, we have a great cross-section today. We're going to be talking about analyzing and monetizing construction uh, defects. Uh, Pete, Peter Heck gave a great little intro to everybody, but I'm going to kick it over to Pete Fowler just to give us just a couple words. Pete? Hi, everybody. I'm Pete Fowler. Uh, great. Happy to be here. Uh, my business is called Uncreatively Pete Fowler Construction. We uh, we have an office. We started in Southern California. We uh, we in 2005 we opened an office in uh, in the Pacific Northwest in Portland. We've got uh, an office in um, Nevada and Texas and Florida. 
So we I mean, we work in all 50 states, but uh, we've got um, we have physical people and offices in those other spots. And um, it's mostly, it's uh, the expertise is in building inspection and testing and in construction cost estimating and construction management, but it's 80% claims and litigation based on the expertise there. So lots of construction defect litigation, lots of property and injury claims, lots of construction contract claims. So anything that makes people sad about buildings, we work on. Uh, Elaine, you wanna go? Sure, I am a Senior Vice President, Senior Corporate Counsel US and the Privacy Officer at Hill International. I have been here at Hill for now almost 13 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, Hill International is a worldwide publicly traded construction management and project management company. We are the owner's rep for their eyes and ears and we try to make sure projects get done properly, come in on time and on budget and uh, try to stay out of litigation if we can. Yes, well, uh, I, I appreciate that, Aileen, and, and, and that's a big part of, right, of, of construction defect, and we have a lot to unpack. We'll try to get through all of it today, and, and of course, you could always follow up, but, but construction defects, we all know, right, it, if the work's done on the front end, sometimes it doesn't even happen on the back end, but, but we're not always so lucky. Um, Scott, you want to give us a, a brief follow-up to, to Peter's intro before? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Scott Horowitz, I'm our National Director of Graphic Consulting and Trial Presentation here at Magna Legal Services. Um, I myself, I'm an attorney. I don't practice anymore, um, but I do keep up with my CLE. And I got actually started uh, my case as a criminal felony prosecutor here in Chicago, uh, just trying all my cases with my own graphics and, and my own technology, sitting in the hot seat for my own cases. That's how I sort of found consulting was a thing and I've sort of never looked back from there. Since then, I've, I've consulted on just about every type of case there is, uh, and very much so in the construction defect realm that we're talking about here today. Uh, it's sort of my privilege to work with awesome experts, awesome clients, and awesome attorneys uh, like we have on our panel here uh, today. I get to uh, sort of come in at the most interesting part, at least for me, of the trial that I always think. Uh, when you really need to tell your story, you've got a problem to solve, and I really get to work, dig in with you and with your experts, and come up with solutions and tell great stories about, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to say. One, one thing that I always think about um, from a graphic consulting standpoint is if we can help you tell your story, keep the spotlight on you and help you tell your story, uh, then we've really done our job. And I know uh, as we talk about our topic for today, we have a couple examples of, of how, uh, how we assist with that kind of thing. All right, Scott, I appreciate it. So um, at, at, at this point, you know, Let's, uh, Pete, I'm going to kick it over to you, Pete Fowler, and, and you can give us a little uh, sort of download on, on what we can expect to cover today and, and what we're going to hit. Yeah, Scott, if you want to put up slide three, you can. If not, just, uh, you know, I, I, do, I like the talking head uh, like, we're on, like we're on the TV news. Uh, it it's, it seems, uh, seems compelling. But um, the, the issue here is we're trying to do a 30,000-foot view because it, I, people get lost in the forest of construction defect cases. I've been seeing it since, you know, I started working in construction defect uh, in the 1990s. I, I was an old guy, because you can see that. I, I, all, of the, all of the people I used to meet with in person or just on the phone, they had no idea I used to be a rock and roll guy. Now everybody's like, you play the guitar? So I, I didn't get out of college until I was deep in my 20s. And, but, so and I went straight into construction defect and I immediately saw that people just didn't understand them. But, you know, most lawyers are terrible at math. I didn't know this. Um, I, I learned this being a cost because I'm a cost estimator. So connecting, um, in particular, connecting problems with construction directly to the cost, right? We're going to break down. Um, if you go to the next slide, the whole idea is that we want to teach you uh, by the end of this that you need to be able to get to something. This is an app. This is a very, very simplified allocation of responsibility for the in generic project that we sometimes teach with but you know how do you identify what's wrong what the various parties think it's worth you know in this case we you know it was, a, it was an outhouse was a silly uh, example but you know what is what does the owner say it costs you know in some of these cases the owner say it's 10 million dollars and the, the defense side says it's a hundred thousand dollars and how's anybody to know right. and then you know, and then who's responsible? Is the owner responsible for any? The general contractor, the designer, the landscape contractor, the framer who put in the windows, the roofer? How do you allocate responsibility across those parties? What's the framework? So today's program is simply a 30,000 foot view of a framework for 
analyzing, first of all, organizing, then analyzing, and then monetizing the defects. So the next slide is just a, again, a generic um, simplified framework for doing an exposure analysis for any one of those parties. Whether you represent the, you know, if you represent the developer, or the general contractor, or one of the key target players, you might be associated with, you know, if you haven't, if you have done construction defect litigation, you know, there's often more than a hundred allegations or defects or issues or whatever you call them. Mm -hmm. And in some of these cases, we might have 50 parties to allocate the responsibility to. But regardless of who you are in that, I've actually had cases that had more than 100 parties. So it's crazy. Yeah. But the, the issue is how do you figure out your exposure? So if there's 100 issues, but you're only associated with seven of them, even maybe seven, and they say seven, and you say four, you know, how do you get an exposure analysis for your best case, your worst case, and your most likely um, exposure for, for paying what's reasonable or, or deciding to pay a little bit more than is reasonable just to get out early or um, not paying what's unreasonable and fighting for a long time so you can get closer to what's reasonable? That's the idea of this whole program. Yeah, and, and for, for anyone that's really, in, and if you want to flip to the sensible list uh, oh, one there, um, but, but for anybody that's handled uh, construction defect claims or, or has been involved in them, you know, we, we, we're all keenly aware that, that it takes in, you know, they're usually, um, you have to really drill down on issues. You have to understand the issues because if you don't, you can certainly get lost, um, you know, in the weeds. Um, there's a lot of parties involved. You have to understand the structure. You have to speak the language, quite honestly, of the folks that are on the ground or in the boardroom, you have to be able to do both. Um, and, and a big part of that certainly is, um, you know, as Pete touched upon, it is understanding and, and having an, an organizational discipline, right? And, and recognizing who the players are, what they do, what their respective responsibilities are. Um, because absent that, without that, you know, you you know, at that point, then you don't know what you're doing, right? Particularly, look, I, I you know, I get, a, you know, a majority of my practice is on the back end after, after the project's done or the damage is quote unquote done um, and the lawsuits come in. But, uh, you know, on the front end, somebody like you, Aileen, you, you get involved there, you know, you're, you're more so trying to help avoid those issues if you can, right? Absolutely. My goal is to keep us out of litigation and get us out as quickly as possible if we're brought in. And figuring out where the problems lie is always your first um, uh, step. And I always find that um, making sure that we get experts on early to uh, give me a realistic picture of where there's a problem, if my company is part of that problem, or if not, how to show uh, the parties who really is responsible. Yeah. And I find that, that getting the experts in early really helps me with that, getting an idea. I've had cases where uh, we've been brought in, there are no damages against us. So we're just dragged into litigation for no reason. And I, I need those experts because if there are no damages, there's no case against us. Um, so it's very important. Also making sure that it's not a jury trial. Nobody on a jury wants to listen to your construction defect claims. They're falling asleep. That's the problem. So you really need a, a judge who knows what you're talking about to hear the cases. Um, and trying to get that negotiated early on is, is very important to me. And um, also looking at the forest for the trees, making sure that if you can get out of it quickly, get out. There's no reason to spend a fortune in litigation if a small amount towards the fix will resolve the situation. So early on, we try to get into mediation try to see if we can bring the parties together to figure out what the fix is, convince the owner, you know, what fix is realistic and how to move forward to it rather than spending all the money on litigation. And, and that's just a practical outlook. A lot of times you can't get out. And, and obviously that's when you need Magna, you need Paul and you need Pete. Yeah. I mean, it's actually funny that you say that too. Um, our, our consulting practice, so not just graphics consultants and trial technology consultants like myself, but our jury consultants as well, uh, we're getting involved, especially during the pandemic now, but but even before then, more and more on the early side of things to 
test theories and test themes, just like you said, if maybe a small amount of money up front uh, is going to take care of all of this, you know, so we have, we have consultants and we have products like our jury evaluator product that can really, it's not necessarily even for a jury trial, but can really help you assess what your damages are or could be, help you assess your exposure, help you identify themes early. Uh, for someone like you, Pete, like an expert, um, I know you were talking about getting in your experts early. It's really common for me now to work with someone just like Pete early on, help create the, the type of graphics, even if they're very kind of simple ones that are going to get used in your expert reports that are going to then sort of seal the deal in an early mediation or even in a motion for summary. And and I just want to say a lot of times the owners of uh, proceedings you're yes. talking about. A lot of times the owners are unsophisticated. You're dealing with public entities, having the photographs, having the, the visuals to work with the experts. It makes all the difference in the world, especially early on at mediations or conferences to try to get all the parties on board. Yeah. I became a fairly well-renowned expert by writing the first national article uh, that, that I know of still to this day uh, that got published on the subject of construction defects. And when, when I was writing that article, the, the, the editor yelled at me. He said, Pete, stop using 25 cent words. We're going to dumb this thing down to, 20, to, to the fifth grade reading level. And I thought, boy, these construction guys are stupid. And just didn't think much of it until the article got published. And all my lawyer friends and clients called me and said, you know, what a great article. It was such a smooth, easy read. So even people who have plenty of brain capacity to read at the, you know, whatever, doctorate level, prefer to be spoon-fed the information. And I'll tell you, the, the, the work that um, Scott has done in putting these presentations together, uh, we, my, surely my office has spent time, more time and more money than it would have cost for them to just do it right the first time, right? Well, yeah. Thank you. And, and you're totally right, though. My, but keeping it simple is what it's, it's what it's all about. I mean, it, you should be able to explain it to like my fifth grade daughter, let's say, and, and, and spoon feed it and, and take something that's as complex as some of the issues that we're talking about and keeping it simple and straightforward. Because if, if someone can get your message in about five seconds, uh, then I think you're going to win your case. The mantra in my office, and it plays to the next section that we're going into about making a sensible list. The mantra in my office is explain this to Pete's mom, because my mom's a very smart person, but she didn't get her high school equivalency until she's 48 years old. And I actually have the picture of her graduation, 48 years old. She told my daughter, and I say, I say to consultants all the time, my mom has no idea what you're talking about. They're like, oh. <laughs> so they have to go back and you know work on continually explaining it in simple language that a, a non-engineer can understand and use to make a smart decision. Yeah, and and I think I think sort of what we're talking about and and kind of globally is the idea, and this is this is kind of the first half of of what we're talking about is is analyzing these claims, right, and and yeah. doing the work on the front end, um, so so that we can understand and and begin to develop right where we're going, what what we're going to do, and how how each of us in our respective roles or or sort of go, going to help bring resolution, right? Because because ultimately we're problem solvers in our own ways, right? We, we, we may, we may have different, we may be solving different problems. We, we may not be on the same side of the ledger all the time, but we're problem solvers. And so if you don't understand the problem, if you haven't done the work on the front end to, to, to break down that problem, to, to make it understandable to folks. So, so quite honestly, that you understand it so that you can have a conversation with your own clients. So they, they understand that you know what they did and, and can explain to them why it is that, that you're in the situation that you're in and, and, help you, and how you can help them get out of that situation. Um, whether it's Aileen, as you said, trying to do it you know, from an economic perspective and an early stage, which I'm a big proponent of certainly, um, and, or, or if it's something else where you have to develop a detailed litigation strategy where you know, you're doing a deep dive with somebody like Pete um, at every stage so he can help work you through that. And then, you, you know, you're weaving in the services and the benefits that, that Scott can provide for you. So Scott, show that those next couple of slides, I'll bash them real quick. But, you know, the, the, the importance of making a sensible list of all of the defects or the allegations or whatever, you, causes of action, whatever you call them, making, making a very sensible list 
is very important. And, and, and this is a, a very famous engineering quote that a problem well stated is a problem half solved. So it's, do you have a, a discrete list of issues? And I don't care if there's one issue or there's hundreds of issues. And we, every year we work on projects that have one issue. And every year we work on projects that have hundreds of issues. Usually it's in the somewhere between five and 50. That's the number of issues, but that's a lot, right? And so, you know, Paul and I were talking earlier about when you sit down, say you sit down with the client and the clients are just verbally vomiting, you know, well, we didn't do that wrong and we did that wrong and the guy told me to do that. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold on. I have to take each of these pieces of information and I have to put it in a sensible place. The first thing you just rattled off was associated with my issue number 17. Hold on. The second thing you rattled off was associated with my issue number two. I've got to get this information and take it and hang it on this um, logic structure so that I can then analyze it. And then so each issue needs to then have a price, right? You have to have a cost associated with the issue. So we've got a sensible list of issues, a sensible list of costs that are perfectly associated with each other. Then we make a sensible list of all the people that might be involved with each one of those issues. You know, it's like, okay, issue number one is associated with party number one, five, seven, and nine. Issue number two is only is associated with party number 17, right? I mean, it gets to be this giant, horrible matrix. Um, go to the next slide. You also have, you got to make a sensible list of the timeline of events. By the way, I'm such a lunatic. I didn't make this slide personally. Somebody <laughs> made it about me in my office. If you click the, 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 the graphic one more time. So because I'm such a crazy person about getting these things distilled so that we can explain them to my mom, <laughs> then everything gets better when we, when we explain things simply and sensibly. Um, so again, issues and costs, timeline, players, all the players listed so we know who did what, when, and where. And then all I was just going to jump yeah. in and say, you know, understanding the critical path, especially for in-house counsel and the owner and making sure the owner understands it, I think are key items too when yep. you're making that list so that people get a, an understanding of why things have to go in when they do and who is at fault when they don't and, you know, current delays versus delays that stop the entire project. I, I, it's so important to understand the big picture of construction. And a lot of people come into this like me without a construction background. I, I've now been doing this most of my career, but prior to law school, I had no, no understanding really of that. And, and I think we all have to assume when we go, say we go into a mediation or we go into a, a situation that has more than two people in it, yeah. somebody doesn't know anything. I use this term, I say, this is going to seem irritatingly tutorial but I'm going to read to you what we call our one minute summary. And sometimes we spend an hour talking about my 200 or 300 word summary. They're like, yeah. that's not true. Yes, it is. Or I'm wrong. I don't know. I got the information somewhere else, right? It's, it's it, this go, and this goes back to Scott's simplification of the drawings or sometimes the first graphics are wrong, right? You're like, well, that's what the plans say. Well, that's not how we built it. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's right. And a, lo a lot of times, you know, you, you, you start with the plan and, and they're very complex. Uh, and, and what we'll do then is, you know, we'll either trace it or we'll simplify it. We'll fade from the original plan drawing into something much cleaner and much more simple. And I've got a little, I've got some previews of, I, I guess that's a preview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about soon. Uh, yeah. But it's always a good idea to always start with what's actually the real evidence and use that almost like your anchor when you're telling this story so that you can then simplify it and then distill it down to what your message is. So that visual, that simple visual I'm talking about, that's exactly what goes with your 200 words, you know, your one minute summary. And then hopefully from there, you get what you need. Scott, can you go to slide nine? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. All right, sharing now. Here we go. There we go. So, and, and, and why we're all touching upon these issues and getting into it, right, it is sort of this this kind of global question, right, that, that, that becomes so prevalent in, in all of these matters. And that is, you know, what, why any of this matters, right? Why, why does it come into play? And, and here we've kind of broken it down to, to sort of two segments. One is during the construction itself, and then there, there are the issues that come after. So, 
you know, again, during construction, you know, Aileen, as you mentioned earlier, and, and, and Pete, to some extent, when you're involved before the litigation even comes, you know, th this is why you need to understand who the players are, um, ha have a firm understanding of it. As you were talking about a critical path, Aileen, a moment ago, I thought that was very poignant because it does become so important, right? And, and, and too often, unfortunately, we wind up in a situation where, where we have to explain to folks, hopefully before the issue comes or, or when it can still be corrected, you know, and, and not after, why, why coordination? What, why the way things were done, when they were done and why they were done was so, so critically important and, 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 and how you could try to work your way out of that. Um, because again, as I mentioned earlier, problem solvers, right? And, and so if you can solve the problem before, uh, you know, you're at the courthouse, that, that's, that's a bonus to everybody, right? We'd like to, we, we, you, know, you know, you'd like to think there's a perfect project. There, there's no such thing, right? There's no such perfect design. There, there's no such thing as a perfect project. You're always going to run into issues. And so, you know, as you're working through the process, particularly during construction, you know, you want to know this kind of stuff. Well, yeah. one of the other so, things I, I was going to say that I make our people focus on, so important as a client, documentation. I can't drill that into my people's head in the field anymore. And, and I'm always saying to them, if you don't agree with something the owner wants, document it. If you don't agree with something that the contractors are saying, document it. Because it comes back to bite you when you know, when you're in the middle of litigation and you say, no, I didn't agree with that. And I, you know, and I voiced that, well, what did you do about it? Yeah. Well, it, I wrote to the owner, I wrote to the contractor, I told them this wasn't going to work. You've got to, you've got to get your client to document everything to protect you. Yeah. I mean, even when I'm helping some, someone like yourself tell that story with, with any kind of graphic, it's, it's all about context. You know, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't create even like a simple timeline to show, you know, what happened without that documentation that backs up that one flag on that timeline that might be your key flag you know the one that we color red and we fly in everyone's face is the the key date that's so important to have that context and that stems right from the documentation you're talking about and sometimes it's the initial project and the way they want to do it and i just give this simple example of a project that we ended up in a large litigation for over many years and part of the problem was we were forced to have the project done on a pre-existing foundation. Well, the project was only going to be as good as the foundation if we weren't allowed to rip it out. And that's something you have to remind the owner. You made that choice to cut corners. So you have to be responsible. The contractors and, and the, your owner's rep aren't responsible if it's associated with something you forced upon them. Um, you know, and that's, that's frequent in New York. You know, and every, every once in a while, we have this lucky, wonderful thing where somebody pulls out the letter that they sent, you know, um, you know, via FedEx and they have the, uh, you know, receipt from what, where they returned. Normally, what we hear is, well, I told them it was a bad idea. Did you, did you write it down somewhere? Right. No. <laughs> I just told them. And, the, and, and the, the, again, the issue about having a sensible list of all of these things, being able to take, you know, so... Normally, we have defects at interface conditions, right? Where the roof meets the wall, where the, mm -hmm. where the wall meets the window system, where the window system meets the foundation. And if we have, if we can touch on, okay, you know, and, and what Scott's saying, he takes the plans and he says, here's what was in the plans. And he translates that two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional drawing that normal humans can understand. Mm -hmm. And then, then we contrast it with what happened in the field you know, then we, you know, then we at least get down to just a couple of people arguing with each other. Well, I, I you should have done that. And I couldn't have done this. And you, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Thanks. So that, that, that's the, that's the helpful part when we can really have all the information to contrast what, what was designed, what was in the specs, what actually happened in the field, what was the consequence of what happened in the field. And then ultimately, what do we have to do to repair that? That's the, by the way, that's the monetized part, right? So the analyzed part. And then, so we have this messy situation, you know, sometimes it's from a messy design, you know, and then it doesn't get fixed throughout the process. And then, okay, what are we going to do? What's the fastest, cheapest, most sensible way to move from where we are to the best available alternative? And that's what we try to create. And, and then we monetize it. And that is we estimate the cost of 
you know, designing a new system, fixing what's there, you know, actually executing the construction, hugging and kissing goodbye. That's the monetized part. I mean, you're, you're, uh, what you're describing is almost like, I mean, you're a fantastic storyteller and, and you have this gut punch and it's like, it's like, how do, how do I get you quickly to deliver that gut punch? And a lot of times it's instead of providing all that context and all that messy stuff that gets you there, hopefully, hopefully we're, we're creating a really simple visual that does all that heavy lifting so that you can get to what is so important so fast. Yeah, and, and so really tell a thousand words. Sorry about and, that. And, yeah, the, the the and the natural the natural step is as we were just sort of speaking on was was kind of during the construction. And then the next stage is sort of, you know, look, you're at that 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 point where it's litigation, right? right. Um and, and we all know because we all live in that world at, at one time or another. Um, they, and so once you're there, and Aileen touched on this earlier, um, and Scott too, based on on his experiences, that it, it really becomes a marriage between you know the the, the client, in-house counsel, outside counsel, and the expert. Right? It's it everybody needs to be on the same page, um, and it's critically important. And and in, in prepping for this, Pete and I had a conversation, and I was saying that you know once once I have my expert on board, even at an early stage you know, that, that person becomes critical to me um, in, in putting together and developing, you know, what it is that I need to establish through the course of discovery or, or whether that's formal discovery or informal so that I, I can achieve the best result for my client. And, and without that, you're, you're spinning your wheels. And, and I, I, I have found that particularly you know, so, some attorneys, I, you know, I think they get into depositions or other things. I think they lack focus. I, I think they're kind of all over the map. And, you know, uh, you know, quite honestly, for me, I spend more time probably talking to my expert before a fact deposition um, than, than I do necessarily looking at documents because the, the expert's going to tell me, Paul, this is what I've identified as the key issues. This is what I need to know. And if you can get me the answers to these 10, 15, 20 questions, then I'm going to be able to say X, Y, and Z. And based on those, you know, that that's based on those responses, that's when we'll be able to educate the client after that, right? And that's what's going to be able to help me, you know, draft my report in Pete's situation. And I, I think it's critical. I really do. Well, I, I think it's critical as the client getting the most honest response from my experts and my attorneys as to where the warts are. I want to know where we may have a problem. And if we don't, tell me who caused it. That's what I'm looking for every time, because if it's our fault. Well, OK, then, then we have to accept some responsibility handled. If it's not, then I need to be able to show the people who are coming after us for whatever reason. And, and I. I explain this, and while I we are now where I work now and have worked for 13 years as a first rep, we also had a uh, claims consulting division for many years that that we actually sold. So I'm very familiar with the expert part, having dealt with them. And I was a client of theirs when I used to be a GC for a, a construction company and real estate developer. So I've been on every side of of the project, from, from developing it, from being the general contractor or being the construction manager. From you know, it's fascinating what you learn from the experts, what you learn from your attorneys when you're in the midst of of litigation. Um, we talked previously about specs being wrong and 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 how many houses had leaking windows as a result and problems with stucco and you know things that we've all been stuck in the middle of and right. to figure out how to get out because you know you're not going to, this isn't going to be a quick fix. And uh, I found that that really getting a, a full understanding of the problem, taking responsibility when it is yours as the client, and being realistic are the best things to help resolve the situation. Yeah. And, and, and that's a fantastic story as well. Um, and, and that's a story that that we would help you tell too, because just because you're accepting responsibility doesn't mean you're on the hook for all of these damages that are endless and kind of nonsense. And so sometimes that's, that's really where the focus of, of whatever visual we happen to be creating, or if you're, if you're working with our jury consultant team, what, what the themes are that we're helping you develop. It's not necessarily that this isn't our fault, right? It's, it's sometimes it's what story is best for our case. And that's, I think that's, you hit the nail on the head there. 
So, yeah. so they, it's literally day one training when we hire a new consultant. We hire architects and engineers and contractors and building inspectors, and they're all already super expert before they get to me. But I have to say to them, some of you are probably not, uh, there's more than 100 people on this thing. So somebody's not old enough to remember Perry Mason, but uh, Perry Mason was a TV um, lawyer who defended only innocent people, but they looked very guilty at the beginning of the show. Our work is almost the opposite of that. We represent almost exclusively guilty people, many of whom look very innocent at the beginning. And you know, if you're on the if you're on the defense of somebody and you actually meet them person to person, you want to defend them. Yeah. It's like we have to we have to only the facts. We have to not. It's like we need to be honest with our clients and the people who might have to pay the bills and the lawyers. It's like no, they screwed something up, and there's consequences from it. It's not $10 million, but it might be a million. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's not all bad news, but I mean, sometimes I am just, you know, sometimes I feel it's like, you know, I got to just, I'm not, you know, a professional rainer on a parader, you know. <laughs> One other thing I think you need to just, we should touch upon real quick is the insurance carrier, because in most of these cases, and, and I think we discussed that previously, all of us. Yeah. There's insurance involved. We all have carriers. We need our carriers to approve our counsel. We need our carriers to approve our experts. I mean, so there's, and, and your team with your insurance carrier, at least I am. I look at their money as my money because it's my loss runs the next year. Yeah. And working as closely with them to help you, it, it's so important to be a team with the carrier. And yeah. I, I think that's an important point for people, especially in-house counsel, having that relationship and making sure your experts and your attorneys have that relationship with your carrier and your claims people. So they respect and, and listen to what they're saying. You know, I, I really believe sometimes if you're being sued frivolously, sometimes you really have to take on the battle to prevent it from happening again. Mm -hmm. Getting your carrier to grasp that so they don't have to keep defending you in frivolous suits. It's an important thing. And then there's times where, well, you may have made a mistake and you need to own up to it, get out quickly, find a resolution. But um, that relationship with the carrier is important. And keeping in mind that in construction, there are very high SIRs and deductibles. Yeah, it's different now than, than when I started in this busy business 20 something years ago. The, the, the calculus is, is very different, primarily because of the SIRs, people coming out of pocket with their own money. It's the, with litigation consulting, I mean, that's that's our magna. I think that's like how we we really pride ourselves on those relationships that we have with the insurance carriers. We come in early, and I think we see it and they see it as, as an investment, a small investment early on to test themes, decide if this case is worth going that far. And so we build those relationships of trust. But, you know, it's not it's not an expense, but more like an investment early on in litigation to make that decision about, you know, hey, what is this case worth? Or is this one worth fighting for? Test those themes and test those damages. And then again, test those kind of simple graphics in early on. Uh, that for us, that's what it's all about. But those relationships, you're right, are so important. You have to build that relationship of trust, you know, to pull pull someone like myself into early litigation to help you decide what this case is really worth, what what's its value. Yeah, and that, and that leads us that leads us to to sort of our our next step, which we're going to go into. I think it's a, a a great discussion we're having here. That's that's uh, evaluating and and prioritizing, right? What what we're doing. Why, why are we doing what we're doing to Aileen's point? You know, uh, somebody's cutting, so, somebody's paying, right? For everything that's taking place, for all that we're doing, for folks like me and Pete that are on the outside, Scott, you know, somebody's got to pay for that. So why is it that we're doing what we're doing? How, how does that benefit everybody? Um, and, and, and how can we communicate that? And what are the benefits of it? How do we, how do we deliver that information to folks like Aileen and other folks so that they can understand and, and go back to their clients and explain it to them in a, in a natural way. So, uh, uh, Pete, did you yeah, want to so jump on the next slide? Just has my, you know, I, I try and structure everything and, you know, I try and make a sensible list, right? So, you know, we, we first try and analyze a bunch of documents and information and we have meetings with key people. And again, we're, we're very early creating a logic structure where we're taking, you know, I might read a deposition where oh, we, I, this section two under meetings with key people in litigation, you can't meet with them and ask them questions or interview them. 
in, in some cases when they're on the other side. So we're taking out a deposition testimony, but it might be like, okay, pages three through seven are associated with issue number 17, but pages 14 through 20 are associated with issue number two, right? And, and, and playing that match game to understand what everybody says about what every, every applicable issue there is, you know, there might be, we might work on a project that has a hundred single family homes. It's very common. We might work on a high rise building that has 400 units. And so then we have to really take pains to organize the building information. And then ultimately, once we can, un once we understand what everybody's saying, where everything is physically, we can conduct very targeted and, and, um, and thoughtful inspections. We do analysis uh, um, based on those inspections. We sometimes have to do testing, which is terribly expensive. By the way, lots of experts like to do a lot of testing, you know, because if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. Question the value of the testing. It's like, if you're gonna spend a hundred grand doing a test and it's gonna save you 125 grand, I think you might not wanna do that test. Right. right. But think about it. And then ultimately estimating and doing thoughtful reporting. But again, based on that sensible issues list, what are the dollars associated with each of them? If issue number one is worth a million dollars and issue number 17 is worth $17, you're hopefully going to have the presence of mind to not spend a lot of time on issue number 17. But I have seen in many, many, many circumstances where they don't monetize the issues until later on. And then I'll realize, oh crap, that issue number 17 isn't even worth our time to talk about. Let's focus on issue number one. You know, usually, you know, if there's a hundred issues and I've, I've done this at least 50 times where I literally, I take a, I make a list and say the top 10% um, of our issues equal 94% of this estimate. I recommend we ignore the 90% of the issues until we're done talking and we never get done. Right? right. So if you really can home in on what is key and if you do your work in a structured way, you can. Yeah, and 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 I think um, if, if we kind of spring forward, Scott, to number fourteen at this point, um, when we're talking about sort of uh, you know really drilling down now on what the specific issues are and, and analyzing those those defects in in and of themselves, it, it's you know at some point what, once we get past the stage of of trying to prevent issues and they already exist. At, at some point, you know, there's an analysis that needs to take place. P part of that will start with folks like me, right? I'll be I'll be working the paper. I'm I'm going to start with the contracts. I'm going to understand who the parties are, what what my client did, what their scope of work was. I'm going to I'm going to obviously focus on the indemnity provisions, which are so critical in these cases, mm -hmm. any insurance obligations, so that I can properly advise you know all the folks that are involved. But, but also too, you know, once, while, while that's taking place, there are folks like Pete um, and, and Aileen, to your extent that, that you know, you're going out there, you're, you're interfacing with the folks that are still on the ground and, and figuring out, you know, where are we at? What can we do? How, how can we, you know, what is our quote unquote plan? You know, number two here, what, what's our plan? What's our path forward? Let's just not run around and, and check boxes in an indiscriminate order. And I, I, again, you know, I just find that in these type of cases, more than, than almost any other cases, if you're not organized, if you don't have a detailed structure as to what you want to do, and I know Pete keeps coming back to it, and, and I'm glad that he does, because it is so important that you just have to, you just have to move through things methodically yeah. when, when you handle these cases, because if you don't, the spend gets out of control, um, and you're not really working towards what you're supposed to be doing. Aileen? If I, if I can just touch upon, especially with, like, because you said homes, like single family homes, a lot of times you have plaintiff's lawyers, they hear about a, a, a some type of a defect, some type of a problem, rather than getting their clients the fix, they're more interested in blowing up fees, getting more clients. You can pull the carpet out from under them if you can figure out what the problem is, how to fix it and offer that to, the, to your homeowners. It's just a much faster win-win. Your your company reputation is better, and you save a fortune in litigation. If you can say, 
to the, to the lean of the clients, hey, we know what was wrong. We realize there's a problem. We'd like to just come out and take a look at your house and see if we can tell you how we'd like to fix it. Right. And you can end the litigation there a lot of the time. If, you know, and, and I've been in the situation where a bunch of clients have dumped their plaintiff's lawyers because all they wanted was their house fixed. And they got annoyed that people were churning fees. So that's, yeah, and, and you, that's a good plan. Yeah, and you're seeing a lot of that, Aileen, in, in, in some of these states like California, the, there's the right to repair. Florida's got the, the 558 where, where, you know, in theory, you're supposed to give the contractor an opportunity to, to, mm-hmm. to, to come out, inspect it, and address it and, and before you sort of get to the litigation stage. And, and you know, at, at least, you know, at, at some level, there, that does exist. At some, at some level, there are folks that, you know, they, they don't want to get, you know, they, they just want their windows to stop leaking. They, they don't need a two and a half year litigation to, to, to get a new window. They just, they just want the window to stop leaking. And, and, you know, again, to, to your point, Aileen, if, if you don't even put in that level of effort, right. And at that, at that stage to at least determine what is it, you know, sort of early on that the other side really wants. And so that we can give somebody, you know, that you, Aileen, in your situation can, can give me proper instruction or Pete, or I can give Pete proper instruction or somebody like Scott to his point where, you know, he can put together some graphics at an early stage that, you know, show somebody, look, you know, we, we've looked at the issue. We, we, we've taken the information that Pete has given. We've built that in. And, and now we're presenting that to you in such a way so that you can understand it. We, we, we understand that you're in a tough situation and, and yeah. right, let's be honest, nine times out of 10, you know, these things exist because there is a problem, right? There it, is a problem. The roof is leaking. The windows are leaking. The, the problem, right? It's right. So exactly. don't, don't so, get lost in the forest, right? It, that, that's what happens. They get lost in the forest. Yes. Yeah, so this, this, uh, your, your graphics on this case study that we have are, are excellent. I'd, I'd love for you to show those. Yeah. And, and I would just say one other thing and showing empathy and the fact that you care that their roof yes. is leaking and their windows are leaking and they're uncomfortable and that you care enough and you're listening, just listening goes yep. so far. Yes, you're totally right. I'm going to tee up those graphics right now, Pete, if you want to talk about the case study. But before you oh, get yeah, into this just happens to be a project we worked on where there was a $7.2 million educational facility that was qualified as lead platinum and it was net zero. So that is they make as much energy on site uh, over the course of a year as they consume. Um, and so the, um, the owner, the school district, they paid about twice as much as the national average uh, for this facility. And then you know, part of uh, a net zero lead platinum facility is that it's super, super energy efficient. And in this, they decided to use structural insulating panels. You can walk through this, Scott. These are great. Uh, ex- in, the, in the roof system, yeah. and so you're, you're looking at structural insulated panels that were only a couple of years old not, and that, that immediately began deteriorating dramatically um, because they, um, the moisture got in to the system uh, during and after construction and it couldn't get out. And modern engineered materials like oriented strand board, as soon, if they get wet and stay wet, they start to deteriorate, yeah. right? Yeah. In an old building, I used to own a house that was built in the 40s and it had old growth redwood timber and it leaked, you know, the air blew through the place like hell. So it, you know, it was like mold remediation by the wind blowing through. You know, wood can get wet as long as it doesn't stay wet too long. But boy, this, you know, some, an engineered material like OSB that's a bunch of little bitty chopped up pieces of wood glued together, it, it starts to deteriorate in a matter of weeks. It's fascinating. It grows mold like crazy. So go ahead and walk through this, Scott. It's really uh, a great graphic depiction. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and this, is, this is what we're all talking about, right? And why it's so important, Aileen, you said it, to get experts, but not only any expert, right? But good experts, thorough, um, so early on so that you have that information you need. So here, you know, this is based on a case study that Pete provided and we, we worked kind of in collaboration with him to help him tell this story. And that's kind of what you're seeing now here. We're talking about what are those SIPs? And so for him to, instead of using those images um, 
that we had beforehand to kind of turn it into this build like you're seeing here. So we'll slowly introduce these elements, you know, one at a time, talk a little bit about what they are, and then really kind of create it in a way that, you know, as Pete is talking about what the SIPs are and what's con what they're consistent of, you know, there's that particle board, basically, there's the two by fours that surround it, there's the layer of foam in between it. And as he keeps talking about what these are, you know, then we keep sort of adding new information and building upon, uh, upon it so that he can tell that story about how they're energy efficient, and then what we do with them next. So here we're then going from uh, the one SIP to what the, all the panels kind of look like when they start being laid out and stacked, you know, end to end. Not only that, but, you know, there's supposed to be uh, that layer that goes, um, the sealant that is placed in between them. So you can really talk about what goes on. There's the structure, um, there's the underlayment that goes on top of them. Then there's our metal, our metal panel roof that goes on top of that. And then all of those, you know, are contained in the roofing. So the entire facility that you're seeing here, you know, we go ahead and take our photo and we really highlight just where it is so that Pete can, again, really zero in on what we're talking about and why this is a net zero property. So now for him to explain what so, um, what happened here, what happened in this case, again, so that he can deliver that gut punch, you know, what, what this case is all really about. We try to create graphics like this that you're seeing here to help him do that heavy lifting. Simple illustration, something that you can tell that fifth grader, or like Pete says, you could tell his mom, talk to his mom with this one, but do a simple build with some illustrations to show, hey, panels were left out in the rain. The membrane was never applied. Uh, the membrane was never applied so that uh, things started to get wet. And then, you know, as things were getting wet, uh, humidity was starting to build in from the ending below because the sealant was never applied in between those SIPs. So first we show the way it ought to be, the way it was supposed to be. We kind of identify what the problems are. And then we very quickly talk about, you know, hey, the panel should have been covered properly. You know, hey, again, number two, the panel should have been completely dry. And then number three, that sealant should have been applied in between the layers. So that way, you know, now here's our gut punch, right? And although, you know, I tried to talk real fast because I want to be mindful of our time, uh, you know, Pete can do a lot of the heavy lifting with slides like this, so we can get to this last slide here and he can really deliver that gut punch. Or you, you know, as the attorney, the presenter, if this actually does see the light of day in a jury trial, you can deliver a gut punch with a slide like this as well. It really is going to hammer home your point and explain what happened in this case. Yeah, and, and, and actually everybody's in for a treat because Pete, we're going to have you go ahead and grab a guitar off the wall and give everybody a little... Uh, Sing you know, a little song. A little yeah. song. Yeah. No, we're we're gonna spin forward now to we're gonna talk about budgeting. Um and in and in particular, um Scott, why don't you bounce ahead to the to the roles and responsibilities um section of it? And and this, you know, when when we're talking about budgeting and and um construction and, and certainly we understand it on the front end, right? Um so much of it goes into it. And as Pete mentioned, he was a cost estimator uh previously and, and he's an expert cost estimator now. Um, but, but a big part of it, too, is, is sort of understanding, you know, who, who everybody is at the site and how they sort of come into play um, when, when um, you know, you're trying to evaluate, you know, how is it that we're going to carve this up? So now, now everybody's done their, their work, all their experts, the numbers are in, right? And there's some universe there. It's, it's on one side, you're going to have a, a plaintiff. On the other side, you have the various defendants. But you understand that there is some bracket that exists there. And then the issue becomes, how do we start cutting that up? And how do we go about that? And so, Aileen, I know for you, you, you tend to, to come in as more of like a project management at avenue. We're project managers and construction yep. managers. So we would be the owner's rep. Um, they're on in the owner's behalf as their eyes and ears trying to make sure the project comes in on time, on budget, making recommendations to the owner as to whether the work was performed properly, reviewing the payment request, the invoices, um, discussing change in orders. You know, we come in and, and basically help an uneducated owner understand what's going on. Um, and that, that's our role at Hill. And in some circumstances, you know, we've represented owners' representatives. We do it all the time, but we've represented them where um, where they've taken a lot of pictures of super bad work that they should have gone, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And they didn't, right? So, I mean, that that's that's the circumstance where, you know, where an owner's representative is like, 
yeah, we better give them some money, right? Or but we've, we're in, we're in but a we've situation. also had circumstances where they've taken pictures of bad work and they've you know shown it to everybody and gone, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they're like, we're in too much of a hurry. We got to just finish this project. That's a get out of jail card, right? As long as you, as long as you documented that you said something and you showed it, to, which is why I pushed push documentation. Come on. If you see something, put it in writing, cover your butt. <laughs> So we haven't gotten to any questions yet. Let me let me answer one. It says, is the owner the same as the developer in connection with building a, a single family spec house? And in, it's a very smart question because we what we call, we, and we rep regularly represent the largest home builders in the country. So we call them the owner, developer, builder, seller, right? That's like, that's like four distinct hats in some um, situations. But in some, if they're direct selling to the consumer and they owned the dirt and they designed the building, you know, so, yeah, so sometimes they're the owner, developer, designer, builder, seller. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's a lot of hats that, um, that, a, that a, a national home builder or, or, or some smaller ones might, might wear. And again, this this takes us to sort of, you know, assessing damages then and, and whether or not we're even talking about fault and we're talking about roles and responsibilities. That's another um, message or story that I get asked to sort of help uh, tell, you know, when we get to any stage of litigation, but it, very much so in the early stages. And I think that's one of the things, you know, Pete, you put together these flow charts that we're seeing here and we worked with you to kind of create uh, sort of a flow chart that you might use if you were giving a presentation or if you were testifying. Yep. Let's so see I'll, it. I'll, I'll put that up now. But sort of, again, you know, instead of uh, having everything on the screen at once, allowing Pete to kind of tell his story and go from, you know, one to the next in a series of steps. Um, so we build and talk about the owner and that relationship. And then I think players charts like we're seeing here, they just make for awesome storytelling devices. Players charts come up in almost all the cases that we wind up consulting on in one form or another, because it's a really great way for you to delineate what the relationships are and what you should be on the hook for versus versus what is, you know, was never part of your responsibility. And so we kind of worked with you to create this presentation that I'm kind of walking through now. And I know, I know we're short on time, so I'm going to walk through it quickly. But again, instead of putting it all on one screen, really, really delineating, breaking it apart, and then going from, you know, drilling into what you really care about so you can deliver that gut punch uh, that I know is coming. It's great for showing privity of contract too. Yeah, right. that, that's that's what I was going to say, Aileen, P particularly from my perspective. I, I, yeah. I find it very useful because, again, as I mentioned earlier, for someone like me, I start with the agreements, right? And that's that's what's so critical is understanding how, how it's going and how the flow is, is working from it um, and, and understanding privity, as, as you said, and, and who are the folks that potentially could be related to a particular aspect of it, right? And, and, and how do you get, get indemnification? Well, yes. And we, as I said, we, uh, it's a, it's always an issue. It comes up in every single, every single one of these cases, no matter what, right? Because at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, we, all this stuff costs money, right? And, and as a result of that, there's always someone believes whether they're right or wrong, they, they want somebody else to cut that check. And, and those provisions, you know, are, are critical. Um, so um, with, with that, we're just about at five o'clock. Um, you know, I think we got a lot done and uh, Peter has, has, he's probably just finished up his workout. It's good to see he's still got his uh, jacket on there, you know, and uh, Peter, you want to take it away? Yeah, I've been eating, um, I, you can't see, but I've been eating Twizzlers and I've been enthralled in this topic. I think it's, I think it's been a great discussion group. Um, I've also been trying to adjust the lighting. Uh, it's funny that you say my working out, I'm, I'm actually in my little office. That's a little gym. Um, it's the only room I have uh, that, that I can get some privacy for these meetings right now. I actually drive um, down to the Jersey Shore every day to work at, at a remote location. So it's, 50, it's, a, it's a bigger commute than my commute to Philadelphia. Uh, but anyways, you guys were great. I digress. I, you, know, you know, once I get yapping, I can just keep talking about myself forever. And then, you know, people just tell me to shut up all the time. But um, I love it. Uh, Paul, you were great. Goldberg, Segal, you guys are fantastic. Um, if you got, you know, uh, to everybody out there, you know, you've got a claim, you've got a case that, that, that's complicated construction defect litigation, you know, you should be, uh, you know, putting uh, Paul Danner uh, on the speed dial and reaching out to him right away. You need an expert. I mean, do I need to even say anything about Pete Fowler? I mean, the, the guy's incredible, right? And not only that, 
He knows how to jam out. He's got those great guitars, so he'll entertain you and he'll he'll help you, um, you know, kick the adversary's butt really, really well. And um, if you want to see a phenomenal speaker in the flesh, now you've seen her virtually. Put down October seventh for our first bricks and mortar event that I am keeping my fingers crossed will take place in Miami at the W in South Beach. Come see Aileen and, and many other folks um, and you, you will be very happy to be out of the virtual world and uh, you know, hopefully we'll be at a, at a point, Paul, where if we're having a drink and I spit on your face, it won't kill you. So, you know, uh, we're hoping to get there, Aileen. Uh, Aileen just got vaccinated, you know, yay, yay for you. And last but not least, um, I want to thank uh, Scott Horowitz. Uh, this guy is a, is really just amazing. Uh, so, uh, Paul, uh, you know, I'm going to put the pressure on you. You should hire him and hire him early and often. And everybody else should hire him early and often. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, keep your eyes and ears open for more events. And this is a message to all the, uh, the folks that are watching virtually. If you've got a topic in mind, if you've got a, an idea, something that you want to try out, Give me a call at 732-331-2410. That's my, not my toll-free number. That's my signature number. Call me on that number. Let's talk about the topic. And if we can put together a panel, I'll definitely do it. We try to do these about every other week. Um, and we saw about 4,000 folks last year in our web webinars. So, Paul, thank you again. Peter, thank you. Aileen, thank you. Scott, thanks for making the great graphics. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.